John Quincy Adams was an American statesman who served as a diplomat, United States Senator, member of the House of Representatives, and was the sixth President of the United States from 1825 to 1829. He was a member of the Federalist, Democratic Republican, National Republican, and later the Anti-Masonic and Whig parties. He was the son of President John Adams and Abigail Adams and thus contributed to the formation of the Adams political family. Adams shaped U.S. foreign policy using his ardently nationalist commitment to U.S. Republican values. As a diplomat, Adams played an important role in negotiating key treaties, most notably the Treaty of Ghent, which ended the War of 1812. As Secretary of State, he negotiated with Britain over the United States' northern border with Canada, negotiated with Spain the annexation of Florida, and drafted the Monroe Doctrine. Historians generally concur that he was one of the greatest diplomats and secretaries of state in American history. In his biography, Samuel Flagg Bemis argues that Adams was able to gather together, formulate, and practice the fundamentals of American foreign policy, question mark, self-determination, independence, non-colonization, non-intervention, non-entanglement in European politics, freedom of the seas, and freedom of commerce. Quote, Adams was elected president in a close and controversial four-way contest in 1824. As president he sought to modernize the American economy and promote education. Adams enacted a part of his agenda and paid off much of the national debt. However, he was stymied time and again by a Congress controlled by opponents, and his lack of patronage networks helped politicians sabotage him. He lost his 1828 bid for re-election to Andrew Jackson. He has been portrayed by recent historians as an exemplar and moral leader during an era of modernization, when new modes of communication spread messages of religious revival, social reform, and party politics, and improved transportation moved goods, money, and people more rapidly. After leaving office, he was elected as U.S. Representative for Massachusetts in 1830 serving for the last 17 years of his life with a greater acclaim than he had achieved as president. Animated by his growing revulsion against slavery, Adams became a leading opponent of the slave power. Adams predicted the Union's dissolution over slavery, and in such a case, felt the president could abolish slavery by using his war powers. Historians have in the aggregate ranked Adams as the 21st most successful president. Early life, education, and early career John Quincy Adams was born on July 11, 1767, to John Adams and his wife Abigail Naismith, in a part of Braintree, Massachusetts that is now Quincy. Much of Adams' youth was spent accompanying his father overseas. He accompanied his father on diplomatic missions to France from 1778 until 1779 and the Netherlands from 1780 until 1782. During these years overseas, Adams became fluent in French and Dutch and became familiar with German and other European languages. Though Adams enjoyed Europe, he and his family decided he needed to return to the United States to complete his education and eventually launch a political career. Early Political Career Washington and Adams Administrations Adams initially won national recognition when he published a series of articles supporting Washington's decision to keep America out of the growing hostilities surrounding the French Revolution. While going back and forth between The Hague and London, he met and proposed to his future wife, Louisa Catherine Johnson. Though he wanted to return to private life at the end of his appointment, Washington named him minister to Portugal in 1796, where he was soon assigned to the Berlin legation. Though his talents were far greater than his desire to serve, 
He was finally convinced to remain in public service when he learned how highly Washington regarded his abilities. Washington called Adams the most valuable of America's officials abroad, and Nagel believes that it was at this time that Adams came to terms with the future of public service. He became a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1797, while serving abroad. In 1797 Adams also married Louisa Catherine Johnson, the daughter of a poor American merchant, in a ceremony at the Church of All Hallows by the Tower, London, Adams is the first president to marry a first lady born outside of the United States, and this did not recur until President Donald Trump assumed office in 2017, with Melania Trump as first lady. Massachusetts Politics On his return to the United States, Adams was appointed a Commissioner of Monetary Affairs in Boston by a federal district judge, but this was rescinded by Thomas Jefferson. He again tried his hand as an attorney, but soon entered politics. He was elected a member of the Massachusetts State Senate in April 1802. In November of that same year he ran unsuccessfully as a Federalist for the United States House of Representatives. The Massachusetts State Legislature, then referred to as the Massachusetts General Court, in 1803 elected Adams as a Federalist to the U.S. Senate, where he served until 1808, at which time he broke with the Federalist Party. Adams as a Senator had supported the Louisiana Purchase and Jefferson's Embargo Act, which made him very unpopular with that party. The Federalist-controlled Massachusetts legislature chose a replacement for Adams on June 3, 1808, several months early. On June 8, Adams renounced his membership in the party, resigned his Senate seat, and became a Republican. Harvard Professor While a member of the Senate, Adams also served as a professor of logic at Brown University first U.S. Minister to Russia. President James Madison appointed Adams as the first United States Minister to Russia in 1809. Though Adams had only recently broken with the Federalist Party, his support of Jefferson's foreign policy had earned him goodwill with the Madison administration. Diplomatic Relations Count Nikolai Rumyantsev, Chancellor of the Empire, formally received Adams, and requested a copy of his credential letter. Romance off assured Adams that his appointment pleased him personally. Adams' presentation to the emperor was postponed. However, because of the temporary indisposition of Alexander I, Rumyantsev immediately invited Adams to a diplomatic dinner which included the French ambassador, Armand Augustin Louis de Colincourt, Duke of Vicenza. Numerous foreign ministers then at the Russian court, and many of the nobility. This was the same mansion where Adams had dined in 1781, as secretary of Francis Dana. Tsar Alexander I received Adams alone in his cabinet where he expressed his pleasure at Adams' appointment. Adams told Alexander that the President of the United States had desired him to express the hope that his mission would be considered as a proof of respect for the person and character of his majesty. As an acknowledgement of the many testimonies of goodwill he had already given to the United States, and of a desire to strengthen commercial relations between them and his provinces, Alexander replied, that, in everything depending on him, he should be happy to contribute to the increase of their friendly relations that it was his wish to establish a just system of maritime rights, and that he should adhere invariably to those he had declared. Quote, After these official diplomatic greetings, Alexander and Adams discussed several other issues such as the policies of the different European powers, trade and commerce, and other mutually beneficial prospects, and that Russia's and U.S. could be very useful to each other. Adams was also given private audiences with the Empress and the Dowager Empress, who received Louisa Adams as well. While not officially a diplomat, 
Louisa Adams did serve an invaluable role as wife of diplomat, becoming a favorite of the Tsar and making up for her husband's utter lack of charm. Adams urged Rumyantsev to ask Alexander to act on behalf of the United States in securing the release of the American sailors and ships being held by the Danish. The Tsar ordered the Chancellor to request the release of the American property as soon as possible, which the Danish government complied with. Adams spent a great deal of time securing the release of American vessels and seamen from various seizures and sequestrations. Quote. In 1811, Adams received a commission from the Secretary of State to serve as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. He promptly declined and remained in St. Petersburg. In 1812, Adams witnessed and reported the news of Napoleon's invasion of Russia and the latter's disastrous retreat. Also in 1812, Rumyantsev asked if he should request Alexander to mediate a pacification of hostilities between the United States and Great Britain. The U.S. accepted the offer and in July 1813, two associates of Adams, Albert Gallatin and James A. Baird arrived in St. Petersburg to begin negotiations under mediation by Alexander. Gallatin was at that time Secretary of Treasury and the Senate rejected his appointment to the diplomatic mission as unconstitutional. However, this rejection did not occur until after Gallatin and Baird had left for St. Petersburg. In September, Lord William Cathcart delivered a British message to Alexander explaining their reasons for declining the mediation. Thus ended President Madison's hope that Alexander could end the war. Adams in Russian Society Adams was personally well-liked by the Russian court and often would be met on walks by Alexander. The Tsar asked Adams if he would be taking a house in the country over the summer. When Adams hesitated, the emperor stated with good humor that perhaps it was a financial consideration and Adams was able to respond in kind that it indeed was in large part. Adams was a man who endeavored to live within the means provided by the American government. The Adamses were also provided with invitations to various entertainments. The formalities of these court presentations, Mr. Adams remarked, are so trifling and insignificant in themselves, and so important in the eyes of princes and courtiers that they are much more embarrassing to an American than business of greater importance. It is not safe or prudent to despise them, nor practicable for a person of rational understanding to value them. Quote. Minister to the Court of St. James's In 1814, Adams was recalled from Russia to serve as chief negotiator of the U.S. Commission for the Treaty of Ghent which ended the War of 1812 between the United States and United Kingdom. The United Kingdom's first peace offer in mid-1814 was unacceptable to the American delegation, as it included unfavorable terms such as the creation of an Indian barrier state out of parts of the northwestern United States. By November 1814, the government of Lord Liverpool decided to seek an end to hostilities with the U. S. On the basis of status quo antebellum, Adams and his fellow commissioners had hoped for similar terms, though a return to the status quo would mean the continuation of British practice of impressment, which had been a major cause of the war. The treaty was signed on December 24, 1814. The United States did not gain any concessions from the treaty but could boast that it had survived a war against the strongest power in the world. Following the signing of the treaty, Adams traveled to Paris, where he witnessed firsthand the Hundred Days of Napoleon's Restoration. During this period, Adams learned that President Madison had appointed him as the minister to the court of St. James's, Britain. Adams arrived in the Britain in May 1815. U.S. Secretary of State In pursuit of national unity, President Monroe decided a northerner would be optimal for the position of Secretary of State. 
and he chose the respected and experienced Adams for the role. Adams had begun negotiations with Britain during his time as ambassador over several contentious issues that had not been solved by the War of 1812 or the Treaty of Ghent. In 1817, the two countries agreed to the Rush Bagot Treaty, which limited naval armaments on the Great Lakes. Negotiations between the two powers continued, resulting in the Treaty of 1818, which defined the Canada United States border west of the Great Lakes. The boundary was set at the 49th parallel to the Rocky Mountains, while the territory to the west of the mountains, Oregon country, would be jointly occupied. The agreement represented a turning point in United Kingdom, United States relations, as the U.S. turned its attention to its southern and western borders and British fears over American expansionism waned. In the adams onis Treaty, the United States acquired Florida and set the western border of the 1803 Louisiana Purchase. When Adams took office, Spanish possessions bordered the United States to the south and west. In the south, Spain retained control of Florida, which the U.S. had long sought to purchase. Spain struggled to control the Native American tribes active in Florida, some of which raided U.S. territory. In the west, New Spain bordered the territory purchased by the U.S. in the Louisiana Purchase, but no clear boundary had been established between U.S. and Spanish territory. As the Spanish Empire continued to fracture during Monroe's second term, Adams and Monroe became increasingly concerned that the Holy Alliance, which consisted of Prussia, Austria, and Russia, would seek to bring Spain's erstwhile colonies under control. In 1822, following the conclusion of the adams onis Treaty, the Monroe administration recognized the independence of several Latin American countries, including Argentina and Mexico. In 1823, British Foreign Secretary George Canning suggested that the U.S. and Britain should work together to preserve the independence of these fledgling republics. The cabinet debated whether or not to accept the offer, but Adams opposed it. Instead, Adams urged Monroe to publicly declare U.S. opposition to any European attempt to colonize or retake control of territory in the Americas, while also committing the U.S to neutrality with respect to European affairs. Adams wrote a draft for Monroe that stated these principles and also proclaimed U.S. support for Republican principles. In his December 1823 annual message to Congress, Monroe laid out the Monroe Doctrine, which was largely built upon Adams's ideas. The doctrine became one of the foundational principles of U.S. foreign policy. 1824 Presidential Election Immediately upon becoming Secretary of State, Adams emerged as one of Monroe's most likely successors, as the last three presidents had all served in the role, although Jefferson also served as Vice President, before taking office. As the 1824 election approached, Adams, Clay, Secretary of War John C. Calhoun, and Secretary of the Treasury William H. Crawford positioned themselves to succeed Monroe. Adams felt that his own election as president would vindicate his father, while also allowing him to pursue an ambitious domestic policy. Though he lacked the charisma of his competitors, Adams was widely respected and benefited from the lack of other prominent Northerners. The Federalist Party had nearly collapsed in the aftermath of the War of 1812, and all of the major presidential candidates were members of Monroe's Democratic-Republican Party. As 1824 approached, Jackson jumped into the race, motivated in large part by his anger over Clay and Crawford's denunciations of his actions in Florida. Voting by state in the 1824 contingent election, States in orange voted for Adams, states in green for Crawford, and states in blue for Jackson. Adams knew that his own victory in the contingent election would require the support of Clay, 
who besides being a presidential contender also had accumulated immense influence in the House and had thrice served as the body's speaker. In contrast, with Clay, Crawford believed in a weak, limited federal government. Jackson's policy views were unclear, but Clay had been outraged by Jackson's actions in Florida, and he feared what Jackson would do in office. Clay's American system called for high tariffs, federally funded internal improvements, and a national bank, all of which were supported by Adams. Adams and Clay met prior to the contingent election, and Clay agreed to support Adams. In February 1825 Adams won the contingent election, taking 13 of the 24 state delegations. After the election, many of Jackson's supporters claimed that Adams and Clay had reached a corrupt bargain, in which Adams promised Clay the position of Secretary of State in return for Clay's support. Presidency Inauguration Adams was inaugurated on March 4, 1825. He took the oath of office on a book of constitutional law, instead of the more traditional Bible. Appointments Administration and Cabinet Judiciary Adams appointed one justice to the Supreme Court of the United States and 11 judges to the United States District Courts. The lone Supreme Court Justice, Robert Trimble, served from May 1826 to his death in August 1828. Adams nominated John J. Crittenden to replace Trimble, but the Senate never voted on Crittenden's nomination. Domestic Policies In his 1825 annual message to Congress, Adams presented a comprehensive and ambitious agenda. He called for major investments in internal improvements as well as the creation of a national university, a naval academy, and a national astronomical observatory. Noting the healthy status of the Treasury and the possibility for more revenue via land sales, Adams argued for the completion of several projects that were in various stages of construction or planning, including a road from Washington to New Orleans. Some of his proposals were adopted, specifically the extension of the Cumberland Road into Ohio with surveys for its continuation west to St. Louis, the beginning of the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, the construction of the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal and the Louisville and Portland Canal around the falls of the Ohio, the connection of the Great Lakes to the Ohio River system in Ohio and Indiana, and the enlargement and rebuilding of the Dismal Swamp Canal in North Carolina. Allies of Adams lost control of Congress after the 1826 midterm elections, and pro-Adams Speaker of the House John Taylor was replaced by Andrew Stevenson, a Jackson supporter. Adams sought the gradual assimilation of Native Americans via consensual agreements, a priority shared by few whites in the 1820s. Yet Adams was also deeply committed to the westward expansion of the United States. Settlers on the frontier, who were constantly seeking to move westward, cried for a more expansionist policy that disregarded the concerns of a supposedly inferior civilization. Early in his term, Adams suspended the Treaty of Indian Springs after learning that the governor of Georgia, George Troop, had forced the treaty on the Muscogee foreign policies. According to Charles Idell, Adams believed that intervention would accomplish little, retard the cause of republicanism, and distract the country from its primary goal of continental expansion. Moreover, fearful that U.S. intentions would outstrip its capabilities, Adams thought that projecting U.S power abroad would weaken its gravitational force on the North American continent. During his term as president, Adams achieved little of long-term consequence in foreign affairs. A reason for this was the opposition he faced in Congress, where his rivals prevented him from succeeding. As president, Adams continued to pursue the peaceful settlement of potential disputes with Britain, including the unsettled border between Maine and Canada. However, 
In 1825, Britain banned U.S. trade from the British West Indies, damaging Adams's prestige in foreign affairs. Adams favored sending a U.S. delegation to the Congress of Panama, an 1826 conference of New World Republics organized by Simon Bolivar. Adams sought closer ties with the new Latin American states, believing that stability among the new states would benefit the U.S. and be conducive for the purchase of Texas from Mexico. 1828 Presidential Election During his presidency, Adams's opponents coalesced around Jackson. Opponents accused Adams of favoring big government, the Northeast, manufacturing, and abolition. Followers of Jackson, Van Buren, and Calhoun formed a proto-party apparatus, raising large sums of money and sponsoring newspapers and local clubs. Vice President Calhoun joined Jackson's ticket, while Adams turned to Secretary of the Treasury Richard Rush as his running mate. This represented the first time in U.S. History that a ticket of two Northerners faced a ticket of two Southerners. The key states in the election were New York, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, which accounted for nearly a third of the country's electoral votes. Departure John Quincy Adams left office on March 4, 1829. Adams did not attend the inauguration of his successor, Andrew Jackson who had openly snubbed him by refusing to pay the traditional courtesy call to the outgoing president during the weeks before his own inauguration. Later Congressional Career Adams considered permanently retiring from public life after his 1828 defeat, and he was deeply hurt by the suicide of his son, George Washington Adams, in 1829. Returning to Washington at the age of 64, Adams expected a light workload, but Speaker Andrew Stevenson selected Adams chairman of the Committee on Commerce and Manufactures. Adams ran for governor of Massachusetts in 1833 on the anti-Masonic ticket. Incumbent National Republican Governor Levi Lincoln, Jr., was retiring so Adams faced that party's John Davis. Democrat Marcus Morton and Samuel L. Allen of the Working Men's Party. Davis won a plurality with 40%, Adams took 29%, with Morton taking 25% and Allen 6%. Because no candidate had won a majority, the election was decided by the state legislature. Adams withdrew and endorsed Davis, preferring him over Morton and Davis was chosen in January 1834, when James Smithson died and left his estate to the U.S. government to build an institution of learning. Many in Congress wanted to use the money for other purposes. Adams played a key role ensuring that the money was instead used to build the Smithsonian Institution. Adams opposed the annexation of Texas, viewing as unconstitutional the imposition of U.S. citizenship on foreign nationals when those nationals did not hold the referendum. Although there is no indication that the two were close, Adams met Abraham Lincoln during the latter's sole term as a member of the House of Representatives from 1847 until Adams' death. Slavery A longtime opponent of slavery, Adams used his new role in Congress to fight it. In 1836, Southern representatives voted in a gag rule that immediately tabled any petitions about slavery, thus preventing any discussion or debate of the slavery issue. He became a forceful opponent of this rule and conceived a way around it, attacking slavery in the House for two weeks. The plan worked. The petition infuriated his congressional enemies many of whom were agitating for disunion themselves. They moved for his censure over the matter, enabling Adams to discuss slavery openly during his subsequent defense, taking advantage of his right to defend himself. Adams delivered prepared and impromptu remarks against slavery and in favor of abolition. 
Although the censure of Adams over the slavery petition was ultimately abandoned, the House did address the issue of petitions from enslaved persons at a later time. Adams again argued that the right to petition was a universal right, granted by God, so that those in the weakest positions might always have recourse to those in the most powerful. Adams also called in to question the actions of a House that would limit its own ability to debate and resolve questions internally. After this debate, the gag rule was ultimately retained. The discussion ignited by his actions and the attempts of others to quiet him raised questions of the right to petition, the right to legislative debate, and the morality of slavery. In 1844, he chaired a committee for reform of the rules of Congress, and he used this opportunity to try once again to repeal the gag rule. He spent two months building support for this move, but due to Northern opposition, the rule narrowly survived. The discussion of this Missouri question has betrayed the secret of their souls. In the abstract they admit that slavery is an evil. They disclaim it, and cast it all upon the shoulder of Great Britain, but when probed to the quick upon it, they show at the bottom of their soul's pride and vainglory in their condition of masterdom. They look down upon the simplicity of a Yankee's manners, because he has no habits of overbearing like theirs and cannot treat Negroes like dogs. It is among the evils of slavery that it taints the very sources of moral principle. It establishes false estimates of virtue and vice. For what can be more false and heartless than this doctrine which makes the first and holiest rights of humanity to depend upon the color of the skin? In 1841, at the request of Louis Kappen and Ellis Gray Loring, Adams joined the case of the United States v. The Amistad. Adams went before the Supreme Court on behalf of African slaves who had revolted and seized the Spanish ship Amistad. Adams appeared on the 24th of February 1841, and spoke for four hours. His argument succeeded. The court ruled in favor of the Africans, who were declared free and returned to their homes. Nullification Crisis Shortly after Adams entered Congress, the nullification crisis threatened civil war over the tariff of 1828. Adams offered an amendment moderating the tariff, and defused the crisis. Congress also passed the force bill which authorized President Andrew Jackson to use military force if Adams' compromise bill did not force the belligerent states to capitulate. There was no need, however, because Adams' compromise remedied the matter. The compromise actually did not alter the tariff as much as the southern states had hoped though they agreed not to continue pursuing the issue for fear of civil war. Advancement of Science Adams also became a leading force for the promotion of science. As president, he had proposed a national observatory, which did not win much support. In 1829 British scientist James Smithson died, and left his fortune for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. Quote, in Smithson's will, he stated that should his nephew, Henry James Hungerford, die without heirs, the Smithson estate would go to the government of the United States to create an establishment for the increase and diffusion of knowledge among men. Quote, After the nephew died without heirs in 1835, President Andrew Jackson informed Congress of the bequest, which amounted to about $500. Oh, 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 $75. Oh, 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 in 2008 U.S. dollars after inflation. Adams realized that this might allow the United States to realize his dream of building a national institution of science and learning. Adams thus became Congress' primary supporter of the future Smithsonian Institution. The money was invested in shaky state bonds, which quickly defaulted after heated debate in Congress. Adams successfully argued to restore the lost funds with interest. He also relentlessly pursued support for astronomical efforts and observatories, seeking a national observatory for the United States. Death In 1846, 
the 78-year-old former president suffered a stroke that left him partially paralyzed. After a few months of rest, he made a full recovery and resumed his duties in Congress. When Adams entered the House chamber, everyone stood up and applauded. Quote, his original interment was temporary. In the public vault at the Congressional Cemetery in Washington, D.C. Later, he was interred in the family burial ground in Quincy, Massachusetts, across from the first parish church, called Hancock Cemetery. After Louise's death in 1852, his son Charles Francis Adams had his parents re-entered in the expanded family crypt in the United First Parish Church across the street, next to John and Abigail. Both tombs are viewable by the public. Adams' original tomb at Hancock Cemetery is still there and marked simply, J. Q. Adams. John Quincy Adams' original tomb at Hancock Cemetery, across the street from United First Parish Church. Personal Life Adams and Louisa had three sons and a daughter. Their daughter, Louisa, was born in 1811 but died in 1812 while the family was in Russia. They named their first son George Washington Adams after the first president. Both George and their second son, John, led troubled lives and died in early adulthood. George committed suicide and John was expelled from Harvard before his 1823 graduation. Adams' youngest son, Charles Francis Adams, who named his own son John Quincy, pursued a career in diplomacy and politics. In 1870 Charles Francis built the first presidential library in the United States. To honor his father, the Stone Library includes over 14 000 books written in 12 languages. The library is located in the Old House at Adams National Historical Park in Quincy, Massachusetts. John Adams and John Quincy Adams were the only father and son to serve as presidents until George H. W. Bush and George W. Bush. Legacy Tombs of Presidents John Adams Left and John Quincy Adams Right and their wives in a family crypt beneath the United First Parish Church. John Quincy Adams' birthplace is now part of Adams National Historical Park and open to the public. The name Quincy has been used for at least 19 other places in the United States. Those places were either directly or indirectly named for John Quincy Adams. For example, Quincy, Illinois, was named in honor of Adams while Quincy, California, was named for Quincy, Illinois. Adams House, one of 12 undergraduate residential houses at Harvard University, is named in honor of John Adams. John Quincy Adams, and other members of the Adams family who are associated with Harvard. He became the first president to adopt a short haircut instead of long hair tied in a queue and to regularly wear long trousers instead of knee breeches. Though he later described his presidency as the unhappiest time of his life, scholars rate John Quincy Adams in the second quartile in the majority of historical presidential rankings. Historians have often included Adams among the leading conservatives of his day. Adams' foreign policy legacy, and its focus on non-interventionism, led to his name being adopted by the John Quincy Adams Society, a network of student groups that is committed to identifying, educating, and equipping the next generation of scholars and policy leaders to encourage a new era of realism and restraint in American foreign policy. Quote, personality Adams' personality was much like that of his father, as were his political beliefs. As Abigail Adams had feared, John Quincy's brother, Charles, would eventually follow this fate. John Quincy fell in love shortly after he finished school but his mother did not approve of his considering marriage when he was still dependent on his parents for support, and the relationship ended when he fell in love with his future wife, Louisa Johnson. His mother disapproved of this relationship as well. His biographer, Nagel, 
concludes that this disapproval motivated him to marry Johnson in 1797. Despite Adams' reservations that Johnson, like his mother, had a strong personality, Marquis de Lafayette once gave Adams an alligator as a gift, which he lodged for months in the unfinished East Room of the White House, before building it its own lodge. Reports indicate he enjoyed showing it to visitors. Anti-slavery advocacy Before 1820, Adams was best known as an exponent of American nationalism. Later in life, especially after his election to the House, he was famous as the most prominent national leader opposing slavery. He was not an abolitionist, save biographers Nagel and Parsons. The turning point came with the debate on the Missouri Compromise in 1820 when he broke with his friend John C. Calhoun, who became the most outspoken national leader in favor of slavery. They became bitter enemies. Adams vilified slavery as a terrible evil and preached total abolition, while Calhoun countered that the right to own slaves had to be protected from interference from the federal government to keep the nation alive. Adams said slavery contradicted the principles of republicanism, while Calhoun said that slavery was essential to American democracy, for it made all white men equal. Both men pulled away from nationalism, and started to consider dissolution of the Union as a way of resolving the slavery predicament. Adams predicted that if the South formed a new nation, it would be torn apart by an extremely violent slave insurrection. If the two nations went to war, Adams predicted the President of the United States would use his war powers to abolish slavery. The two men became ideological leaders of the North and the South. John Quincy Adams during his final hours of life after his collapse in the Capitol, drawing in pencil by Arthur Joseph Stansberry, digitally restored. In 1841, Adams had the case of a lifetime, representing the defendants in United States v. the Amistad Africans in the Supreme Court of the United States. He successfully argued that the Africans, who had seized control of a Spanish ship on which they were being transported illegally as slaves, should not be extradited or deported to Cuba, a Spanish colony where slavery was legal but should be considered free. Under President Martin Van Buren, the government argued the Africans should be deported for having mutinied and killed officers on the ship. Adams won their freedom, with the chance to stay in the United States or return to Africa. Adams made the argument because the U.S. had prohibited the international slave trade, although it allowed internal slavery. He never billed for his services in the Amistad case. Adams repeatedly spoke out against the slave power, that is the organized political power of the slave owners who dominated all the southern states, and their representation in Congress. Film and Television Adams occasionally is featured in the mass media. In the PBS miniseries The Adams Chronicles, he was portrayed by David Burney. William Daniels, Marcel Trenkard, Stephen Grover and Mark Winkworth. He was also portrayed by Anthony Hopkins in the 1997 film Amistad, and again by Eben Moss Bachrock and Stephen Hinkle in the 2008 HBO television miniseries John Adams. The HBO series received criticism for needless historical and temporal distortions in its portrayal, 